All right, we're rolling now. Everybody feeling a little fire in the belly? Ready to get this week going? Well, Daniel Sheridan is a 37-year veteran of the fire department in New York and commander of the 3rd Battalion in the South Bronx. He's a national instructor level two. He's a member of the FDNY incident management team and president of the mutual aid training group. He's part of the FDIC advisory board and has written numerous articles for fire engineering as well as a radio program, First Due Battalion Chief for fireengineering.com. He authored the forcible entry chapter in Fire Engineering's Handbook for Firefighter 1 and 2. He travels throughout the United States and Latin America lecturing, teaching firefighting essentials. He's also an FDIC instructor. He hosted a new initiative in the FDNY training division called Remote Tactical Training, where he would take his crew to different locations throughout the city and film different relevant topics. Please welcome our keynote speaker, the Sandman, Daniel Sheridan. Wow, welcome. Hey, I want to thank Dave. Dave, well, he just walked off the stage. He just cleared up a mystery, a question I was asking myself for like a year. I said, you know, how come I never got that call? You heard what Bobby's description was of his uh, replacement for, for editor-in-chief, right? No, that was a joke. He's supposed to laugh, but I guess, okay. <laughs> anyway, well, welcome, 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 welcome. And welcome to Marsha and all the Halton family. Hi, guys. That one, you, one of you, I, I look at you and I see Bobby. And I, I just, like, I feel Bobby's here. And I know he's here. Anyway, so, when Bobby asked me to deliver this speech, I have to tell you, I was so honored. And I have to tell you, honestly, I am eternally thankful for everything that Bobby has ever done for me. Now, I could use these 20 minutes or so to eulogize Bobby, but I know, I don't think, I know that's what, what he wouldn't want me to do. Instead, I'm gonna give the talk that we had agreed upon. Now, I told him though, Bobby, I said, what I was planning to talk about is not going to be the typical speech that one may expect to hear here at FDIC. And you know, he was 100% on board. I first met Bobby in 2005, on Good Friday, no less. Now, you have to picture in my mind, right? Bobby to me was like the pulp of the fire service, right? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm asking the pulp for something now, right? So I sent him an email in another magazine asking if they'd be interested in helping me promote a project that I had started in South America right after 9-11. Well, the Pulp responded immediately. And after that, the relationship was formed. Now, I'd like to pose a question. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I thought about it afterwards. I, I thought about it this morning. I said, I'm asking this question, and I'm preaching to the choir. I really am. Everyone that's here, I'm, I'm definitely preaching to the choir. But anyway, I'm going to ask it anyway. I want you to think about it, right? I want you to think about it and ask yourself this. Is the fire department just a job? Or do I volunteer because it's like a cool thing to do? Or am I a firefighter, right? In Spanish, they say, soy bombero, right? It's like, I am a firefighter. I recently watched the new Top Gun movie, and Maverick said about being a pilot, he said, it's not what I do, it's who I am. Now, I've always felt that the fire service was a calling, not a job. Right. When I was in college I, and I graduated, I worked on Wall Street in 1983, and I had an opportunity, a great opportunity, to become a broker on Wall Street. But there would be no other job for me. See. I had read the report from Engine 82. Anyone ever read that book? Report from Engine 82 in high school. And after reading that book, all I ever wanted to do was be a firefighter in the South Bronx. I asked my friend one time, I said to him, I said, what led you to become a firefighter? You know, what led you to the fire service? You know what he replied to me? He said, there are no more dragons to slay. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, typical. 
So Edward Croker, the commissioner of the FDNY in 1899, summed the firefighting in this way. And he said, I have no ambition in this world but one, and that is to be a fireman. Now, the position may, in the eyes of some, appear to be a lowly one. But those who know the work which a fireman has to do believe his is a noble calling. Our proudest moment is to save lives. Under the impulse of such thoughts, the nobility of the occupation stimulates and thrills us to deeds of, of supreme sacrifice, even, even at supreme sacrifice. I'm sorry, I'm not good at reading. <laughs> but I thought about all the things I could talk about this morning, such as the South American project. I could have talked about 16 qualities of a good incident commander. Or I could have even talked about the FDNY response to Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina. But instead, I'd like to talk to you this morning about what I call the invisible hand on the fire ground. Now, if we truly believe that the call to the fire service is indeed a calling, right, then logic would dictate that he who called us to the service would take care of us and watch over us. Agreed? A chief from another department, now I can't remember, I can't recall who he was at this time, but he said to me one time, he said, I may be in command, but I'm not in control. As I look back over these past 37 years, truer words had never been spoken. Back in 1986, on the last day of Proby School, the chief lined us up to give us some parting words. He told us, he instructed us, look in front, look behind you, look to the right, look to the left. He said that in the span of our 20 year careers, some of us may not be here. Wow, wow. <laughs> I thought to myself, wow, that's a little extreme. You know, such a harsh thing to say to a bunch of new probies that are starting out on their, their journey as FTNY firefighters? Well, unfortunately, he wasn't wrong. <sighs> Brian Fahey, he would die in June of 2001 on Father's Day. He sat next to him. Howie Carpunk sat in front of me, died in a fire on Walton Avenue in the Bronx in 2005. John Ginley and Chris Sullivan were in front of me as well. They died on 9-11. And Pete Nelson, who was in the other platoon, he died on 9-11. So tragically, we lost these five brave firefighters. But how many more could have we lost if it weren't for someone watching over us. My journey in the FDNY began in, sep in September of 1986, and it wasn't long before I had my first brush with death. Me and another probie were working together this particular night that started out with a fully involved vacant building fire. After the fire, when we returned to quarters, one of our firefighters requested medical leave. He had gotten hit by some roofing that fell off the building and struck him. So this meant now that another firefighter from an engine company had to be detailed to 17 truck and assigned the roof position because you see me and the other probie were brand new. A few hours later, we responded to another report of a fire in the basement of a brownstone building. Me, the other probie, and our captain, we crawled into the burning basement looking for the seat of the fire. We found it, it was in a rear bedroom. Now, the OV did what exactly what he was supposed to do. He vented the rear. Suddenly, the captain grabbed the two of us and screamed, get out, get out! He recognized that the room that we were in was about to flash and he pushed us down the hallway as the flames erupted all around us and auto-exposed, catching the roof firefighter that took a shortcut. Christmas night, 
that same year, we were involved in another flashover when the second floor in a private dwelling flashed over just as we bailed out the window. We were in the firehouse only a few months, and already we experienced two near misses. It seemed to me that the words of that chief were not too far off. Now, over the next few years, I would be involved in, in many situations that would also give me pause. I, I would think to myself, boy, that was close. We got lucky on that one. Right. So now, I'm, I'm, gonna ch I'm gonna shift gears a bit now. I wanna talk about Father Michael Judge. You all know Father Michael Judge. I'm sure you've heard of Father Michael Judge. Father Michael Judge was our beloved chaplain for about 10 years. And I first met him at a fire in Harlem. Right? We would develop a very strong friendship over the next few years until he died on 9-11. Now, we were particularly busy this night. We had already worked at a few fires in the Bronx and Harlem. We were now back at this building for the second time. Right? But this time, they got it going really good. It was, it was going good. The chief ordered us to get to the second floor to search for potential squatters. Now, because the fire was out of the apartment on the first floor and into the public hallway, we had to use a portable ladder to access the second floor. We got onto the second floor, we got into the public hallway, and we found there was a hose line. The engine company that was operating that hose line was not around. So we took it over. It was just laying there, so we took it over. Now, our officer, he had taken off. He was gone. We don't even know where he went. It was just me and my good friend, John Buckeye, on our own, right? And fire was everywhere. It was unbelievable. The floor was so hot, this is before bunker gear, we couldn't even kneel. So we took the line, we advanced it about 25 feet down the hallway. Guess what? We lost water. My eyes were like this. I looked at John, I was like, oh man, <laughs> feet don't fail me now, right? Somehow, we made it to the front of the building and we went down that same portable ladder that we came up. Now, many years later, a captain told me that he was outside the building and he saw fire out almost every window. He heard that we were still in there and he couldn't believe it. Here's what happened. It turned out that the chief decided to go to a defensive operation and use the tower ladder. He had ordered the building evacuated, but we never got the message. This explained why the hose was just lying on the floor. Now, here's, here's the God moment, I think. If that tower ladder tormentor hadn't landed on that hose line, we just would have stayed in there. We would have hung in there the whole time. Afterwards, we're laid out on the sidewalk with steam coming off our coats. And that's when I met Father Mike for the first time. And I think I said something stupid like, I guess you're here to give me less rights, Father. <laughs> this is part of the homily that he gave the day before 9-11 when they, when they rededicated a firehouse in the South Bronx. And uh, I wish I could imitate him because, you know, he was Irish, right? He had these big hands, like these big, strong hands. Like, it was very deceiving. He's such a humble guy, but he was a powerful guy. So, well, you know, so this is like his speech that he gave, like, basically the last homily he ever gave. He says, I'll try to imitate him. He says, he used his hands a lot, even though he was Irish. He says, good morning, everyone. That's the way it is. Good days and bad days, up days, down days, sad days, happy days, but never a boring day on this job. You do what God has called you to do. You show up. You put one foot in front of the other, you get on the rig, and you go out and you do the job, which is a mystery and a surprise. That's when he goes like this. You have no idea when you get on that rig, no matter how big the call, no matter how small, you have no idea what God is calling you to, but he needs you, he needs me, he needs all of us, amen. Looking back over these past 37 years, I firmly believe 
that we do God's work. And he looks out for us. Now here's a few examples of where I believe that God directly interceded in our work. These are all fires I personally witnessed with the exception of one that it was not at. What are the chances I was at a fire where a firefighter fell 75 feet from the roof of a five-story tenement into a rubble-strewn shaft and would survive? What are the chances I would see a firefighter fall through the roof of a vacant factory that was fully involved, machinery all around, and he lands on a bed in the middle that was being used by a homeless person? What are the chances a deputy chief would be vehemently opposed to us entering a three-story vacant frame, and then 20 minutes, the building totally collapses? Now, this is one that I wasn't at. What are the chances a battalion chief at a five-story vacant building with units operating on three floors, asking his aide as like an afterthought, he says, is there any critical information on this building? The aide replied a minute later, yes, chief, under no circumstances shall anyone enter that building. He pulled everyone out of the building and the building collapsed. What are the chances on the advice of a random engineer, a deputy chief, would pull everyone off the pile at the World Trade Center? Nothing happens. He feels foolish. The next day, this is how he described it, a weird looking guy in a blue suit and a white hat shows up and tells him, pull everyone off the pile. And again, he evacuates the pile. As soon as he evacuates the pile, the pile caves in. Now, I have so many more stories, but I'd like to tell this last one in full detail. It happened on Christmas Eve, 1990. And not only was it special because of that, being Christmas, but I think, I always felt that it was the spirit of Harry Hoey from Ladder 17, who was killed in the line of duty in October of 1974, was watching over us. Harry was a special person. He had a unique connection with the community. He was involved in tutoring kids in math with the promise of ice cream if they did well on their exams. He arranged local merchants to donate toys to kids at Lincoln Hospital, which would later be delivered by Santa, you know who Santa was, via Ladder 17's bucket on Christmas Eve. But his greatest legacy? It was something that lasted for 40 years. Harry started a luncheon for the senior citizens of the South Bronx in June of 1974. Now at first, it was just a soup and a sandwich inside the firehouse. Eventually grew into a full turkey dinner, all the trimmings held in the senior citizen center next door to the firehouse. So this is the kind of guy that Harry was, right? So our story begins about a week before Christmas, right? We get a phone alarm for a fire in an apartment in a project right across the street from the firehouse. I had the irons. Billy Larson had the can. Now, Billy, Billy loved the can. He was senior to me, but he loved the can. And he was a wizard with it, man. I mean, when he had the can, it was like magic. But we weren't getting this one with the can. The engine stretched the line, and they put out the fire that started in the Christmas tree. The single mom of four kids had just lost it all. There was going to be no Christmas for them this year. We get back to the firehouse. We're getting ready to go back in service, cleaning the tools, changing air bottles, you know. And then Billy, he rallies the troops. He says, in the, in the spirit of Harry Hoey, he says, we're going to make Christmas happen for her and her kids. They needed everything. The plan was we were going to surprise her on Christmas Eve. I worked the day tour Christmas Eve, and I knew I'd be working overtime that night. And I was looking forward to it. It was going to be a great night. We had gotten a live turkey from the local vivero. Uh, we were going to have mass at this other firehouse but we were going to present this woman with all these donations. 
But being Christmas Eve, the chief and his aide took off. That meant we were going to have an acting battalion chief and someone would have to drive the chief. We're getting a detail, which means another firefighter from another firehouse had to fill in the, the spot for the night from out of the firehouse. So it was totally out of the question that he would drive the chief. I was working overtime, so I was either volunteered or I volunteered. But he was taking my spot in 17 truck. And I, I, just, I want you to listen to that. He took my spot in 17 truck, OK? I was very disappointed. He, he showed up. And he relieved me in 17 truck, right? I went over to the battalion. And I remember, I just, I remember this now, right? When he walked into the firehouse, his gear looked brand new. It was like he just stopped off at the supply store and picked up a set of fire gear, right? And the other thing, he was detailed from an engine company in Manhattan. Now, I don't know, maybe Mike would remember, but whatever, but I'm not sure when we stopped doing these details like from, from out of the battalion, but we never got details out of the battalion, let alone the borough. He comes in, he's looking around the firehouse like in amazement. He had never seen anything like this. You know, he was in the heart of the South Bronx. So now the firehouse is bustling with Christmas spirit. I mean, the guys were so excited about this donation. So around 8 o'clock, they're ready to make the donation. But the chief had other plans. He wanted to go visit his firehouse, then we'd go to Mass. I was going to miss the donation. I was bummed. So after Mass, we went to Mass. We went back to the firehouse. We had dinner. After dinner, we just settled in for the night, you know, a few runs here and there. 17 gets called out for a water leak in the projects, right, which was very normal for them. It was one of the parts of the job that, you know, that you had to take when you worked in this kind of area with a lot of project buildings. And then we got called out for another fire somewhere in, nearby. On the way back, it was a false alarm. We saw 17's rig outside the projects. So being the guy I am, I'm kidding around. I get on the radio, and I'm giving Billy a hard time about some kind of nonsense about being a maintenance man or, or something like that, right? So we get to the corner. We make a turn onto the corner. And at the end of the block, there's this woman at the end of the block, and she's jumping up and down, and she's waving us in, man. She's like, she needed help. I got on the radio. I said, Billy, I said, forget that water leak. I think we got a fire. Probably not in those exact words. <laughs> I can't say what I actually said. <laughs> so we get to the end of the block, and I look left, and I see the fire blowtorch you know, onto the street from the first floor bodega of this five-story tenement. And so later on, Billy would tell me as they're responding, he says, he said, the detail asked me, he says, what do you see, a little smoke? <laughs> and Billy laughed because the fire was out, every window in the rear. So the engine company starts stretching a two and a half into the store, inch and three quarter to the floor above. Now, I'm not too clear what happened next. I'm trying to remember, this is 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Um, I'm not clear what happened next, but I remember that the engine was trying to put out the fire. There were railroad apartments, right? They're trying to put out the fire on both sides. And I can remember the captain saying, come on, hit it over here, hit it over here. So the, they had fire in two apartments, and the fire is racing up the rear of the building, right? Our roof firefighter, he's on the roof. He's scrambling for his life, right? Billy, Billy's the OV. He's got the outside vent. He, he had to bail out onto the bucket. He told me later on that he was going out that window. He was with another firefighter. They were going out that window whether the bucket was there or not. So, you know, when the, the room flashed over. So I remember returning to the street, and I saw this detailed firefighter, and he's standing like this with his hook and his can, like this, like a statue. So I went by, I entered the store, and I met up with the crew. They had knocked down all the fire now. So here's, here's like, let's say, the front of the store. They knocked down all the fire, right? And now we're in the rear of the store. And we're pulling ceilings. We're opening up. You know, we're looking for extension. We're looking for hidden pockets of fire. And then there's a loud commotion. Now, we're in the back of the store now. 
we hear this loud commotion in, in the front of the store. The detail was screaming about some fire. He's like, fire, fire. He's screaming, fire, fire, right? So the lieutenant says, let's go up front and see what all the fuss is about. Again, probably not in those exact words. So we all left the rear. We all go up front, all of us now. We all go up to the front of the store to see what this fuss is all about. We get there, and there's a little bit of fire, embers burning on the doorway. The lieutenant says, this is what all the screaming was about. Suddenly, there was a deafening roar. The whole rear of the building had collapsed in the exact spot where we were just a minute ago. Yeah. So, I mean, these are just a few stories. I want you to look back on your own careers, right? And tell me what you think, right? Think about what happens when the general public is in dire need. They pray to God for help. Who does he send? Right? Now, the damnedest thing, you know what the irony is? No one ever saw that guy in the blue suit with the white hat ever again. And that detailed firefighter, never saw him again. Amen. God bless you. Well, did we do Bobby proud? Absolutely. All right, we're going to wrap up here. Um, don't forget that we've got the Halton Tribute this afternoon. Um, Bookstore is open. Got your classrooms to go. But before we go, we've got to do just a couple little things. Could I get my guys from Georgia to stand up right quick? And anybody that's been through any of our smoke diver programs? Uh, we want to, you know, we're all getting a little old, and they say we got to attract new 18 to 25-year-olds, so they bought me this old selfie stick here. <laughs> so we got to get you guys rolling, but i got to do one thing. Anybody that's been through any of our programs, where, whatever state, just got to do it, just got to do it. What's a good word? Good word. There we go. All right. We did Bobby proud. Now it's time for us to get fired up and go get some stuff done here. Let's get up back there. Let's see you. Come on. You are the star. You are the star of FDIC, not us. Stand up. Let's see it. Get up. Get up. Come on. Get up right here. Out here. Go charge those batteries up and have a great week, FDIC! FDIC!